Okay, everyone, uh, we'll get started. This is Jesse again, uh, presenting the systems engineering uh, series of, of presentations. Uh, and this is part two. Quick agenda, you know, where are we at? What are we gonna do today? Today is a lot about requirements. Uh, there are a few other things we'll touch on as well, but, but the bulk of today is on how you come up with requirements for your satellite. Very significant credit to Sam Baxendale, author of the NS10 EAT system engineering series. And again, this, this also pulls from many, many different sources on systems engineering from across government and industry. So just a few few things to review. You know, we've, we've talked a bit about mission statements, objectives, success criteria, and overview. And you know, those are all kind of starting at the highest level and getting down into the, the actual quantitative. Uh, statements of, of what your satellite must do. And so, so there are different levels to them as we flow down into it, which we'll talk about more today. CONOPS, experiment plan, right? these are all, all things that uh, were talked about in, in the past ones and, and that will be covered in more detail in your mission design document and things like that. And then there's obviously some differences there. So, so these slide decks are also meant to be you know, a, a take home set of slides for you to review over time. So I'm, I'm going to you know, skim over some of these more text heavy slides. This is also for you know, just your review uh, after the fact. Where are we at? We're, we're getting close to SCR. So this one is actually that this whole EAT is, is focused a bit more on what happens kind of immediately after SCR leading up to SRR. We're close to SCR, so you should have been cycling through these things. Um, this obviously should look very familiar to you. You should have been working on those, those early parts, stakeholder expectations, uh, design drivers, kind of some of those pieces. You know, certainly you should have gone through the this cycle at least once, ideally a couple times, to have started to nail down some of the important pieces of your mission. At SCR, there were things that you skipped over being or or, or made high-level assumptions for being these ones. But these are ones that, that we're gonna start to work on in more detail. Uh, now, as we go towards requirements after SCR, one of the things that we'll start to mention, this little note in the left, TBR, uh, kind of like TBD, but but TBR instead of meaning I have no idea what it is, TBR is oh, I put a number in there, but I'm not sure if that's actually the right number. Uh, still needs a little more work, but a, a TBR is usually a you know, something we already have an, an estimate of a number, just not the final value. The mission design doc. This is something we've talked about quite a bit in the user guide. And one of the big things we'll be talking about very heavily at SCR, this is, is captures all the topics that, that SCR is really gonna focus on. You know, what, what is your mission doing? The statement, objective, success criteria, the experiment plan, you know, data, final results to, to answer your, your science or technology question. And, and then of course the comps, more of the timeline piece of that. And so by SCR, you know, we're expecting that, that you will have a, a solid first revision of this. This should have been relatively well filled out. Of course, it will continue to mature over time, but this is kind of the big thing that we're going to look at at SCR. What comes next then? And, and you know, how do we tie this back to the systems engineering D? Right now, we're, we're nearing the end of that mission definition phase, and then it's going to start branching down into requirements, higher level, lower level, all those things. That's what we'll talk about much more thoroughly uh, today in this, in this presentation. The one, one other thing we'll touch on today is, is that the V is a very linear model, kind of waterfall development style, uh, where, we, where we go through this you know, from upper left down to the bottom center and then back up to the upper right. In reality, there's, there's a lot of uh, cycling that happens here. And we talked about that more in the last systems engineering. And we'll, we'll talk about it a little more today because uh, this is kind of a good you know, theory for how this, this may happen, but in reality, there, there's revisiting of things based on, on things you learn, like doing some analysis and realizing it, it, it changes your requirement or your requirement wasn't feasible. So SCR, you know, we're trying to find how to build the right system. SRR then in the requirements is how do we build the system right, the, the verification. Uh, like we kind of mentioned earlier, these, these pieces that we made assumptions on, uh, during SCR are now where we want to focus more for SRR. Uh, so we're going to take those high level kind of objectives, constraints, success criteria, and we're going to push them down into high level requirements, so by pushing flow, flow down, you know, create our high level requirements, 
do that do that logical and functional decomposition to get our requirements out and then keep flowing those requirements down into the lower level ones. Of course, there's there's going to be continual maturity of the mission design document. And then all of this has to be anchored back to reality with budgets, mod and sim, prototyping potentially, uh, right? That those, those pieces don't stop because we need to make sure that, that we're understanding why we're creating the requirements we are. And, and yeah, the you know, mission design doc is, is always a living document, will be throughout the entirety of your mission. So uh, don't, don't neglect that piece of it. One of the questions that, that can result from this uh, very cyclical diagram is, is when are we done? As CR, you know, we were cycling all the way back to the kind of earlier stakeholder expectations, all those pieces. And if, and if you're not done with that, you certainly should still keep doing that even after SCR. However, uh, by SRR, we're, we're hoping that we've, uh, in preparation for SRR even, that, that we're moving to the more of the inner circle. At that point, we shouldn't be rebaselining the major driving requirements or constraints of the mission. We should be getting more into the, the detailed processes. So on the left is kind of another you know, more cyclical process that, that can also be used to understand how this goes and, and tends to be a bit more realistic and uh, reasonable than the, the waterfall B. We want to start cycling on this inner circle and and when we're done in UNP, that, that uh, tends to be when we're at about the subsystem level. So I'll, I'll talk about that more in a little bit. Uh, you know, we don't want you to waste all of your time or, or spend excessive amounts of time doing this. Certainly, this is very important, but we don't want it to go beyond the important pieces into the time-wasting pieces. So uh, this is, is something that, that it'll vary a bit by team but generally down to about the subsystem level is, is where we recommend cutting it off. I've been talking about all these different things I want, you know, what we want you to do at a very high level, but, but how do you actually do it? How do you define your requirements uh, down to that subsystem level by SRR? Well, that's most of what we're going to do, uh, talk about uh, today. So to get started, uh, I'll point you to chapter seven in the user guide. Uh, the user guide is you know, full of, of lots of different information, but uh, one of the things it provides you is, is somewhere around 100 requirements that, that UNP provides to you. And, you know, one of the things that this should not be is, is a, an annoyance. The, these UNP requirements actually have been pared down to kind of the very minimum that, that we can, that we, that we can come up with. And, and the whole goal of them is to help you avoid future pitfalls. So even if some of them don't make much sense right now, certainly if they don't, you know, contact us and we'll help you understand them. But uh, they're based on, you know, the, the 20 plus years UNP has been around. And so uh, they exist to help you avoid future pitfalls and, and things that, that, you know, you may not be aware of yet. Some examples of them. So, so all these requirements, you know, need to be uh, followed by you guys and, and copied verbatim into your, R, your RVMs, your, your requirements verification matrix. It's a big requirements talk about it in a little bit more one of the things that matters in requirements is the language the wording so you can see like in 11.3 there the cubesat shall be designed to meet the specifications and requirements uh shall means that you will be doing it you you shall do it there there is is kind of no ability to work around that uh, it must be done and it must be verified should is more of a soft statement so in this case you know we're saying you should use number four or larger. There are certainly edge cases where you don't need to, but it is strongly advised that that primary structure fasteners are number four or larger. And so most of these are shell statements, but uh, there are a few should statements in there uh, that are, are more just guidance than actual requirements. So what is a requirement? At the end of the day, what, what you'll frequently find is there's some mission system or subsystem, depending on the level of the requirement, shall do some action in a quantifiable, measurable manner. And so what, what this means, right, is, is obviously on the left, mission system subsystem requirements can happen at various levels. Uh, you could have a system level requirement that says uh, something like, you know, you, none of your, your parts can outgas above a certain level. And that obviously applies to the whole system, the whole, the whole satellite, uh, versus at the subsystem level, you know, maybe 
the ADCS has to be able to point to within you know, some, some error uh, or margin of error, perform some action, like I said, you know, pointing to within something, and then the quantifiable measurable manner. So this is where there needs to be numbers in, in almost every case. Uh, saying things like accurate or enough or fast or frequently, those all mean different things to different people and different things to different systems. And so those, those are not good words uh, for requirements. Uh, it needs to be, they need to be verifiable and you need to be able to point to it and say, here is how I'm going to test it and make sure we do this. And we all agree that that's, that that's what, it, what it needs to do. They almost always utilize the verb shell. Like I said, will, uh, required, but does not need to be verified. That's a, a very, very rare case where if, if you're going to do something, you should, you should verify it, can do it if, if it matters. Should, recommended, but not required. And, and this is another one where I wouldn't expect you guys to, to have shoulds in your RVMs. I would expect pretty much all of them to be shalls, uh, with the only shoulds being the things that UNP provides. And UNP, you know, provides those because they're, they're more guidance than actual requirements. Of course, they have to be achievable, right? We don't want to make requirements that are, that are unachievable, uh, unambiguous. You know, we don't want people to be able to, to interpret things differently. And, and in the university environment, of course, with turnover, you can't just assume the person coming in after you will interpret something the same way you will. So it needs to be very clear. Consistent, of course, you don't want to have conflicting requirements. Express in terms of a need, not in terms of a solution. So uh, what this means is, is, for example, take ADCS. You want to say something like, like, like I said earlier, ADCS must be able to point to within some error margin. Uh, we don't want to say something like the ADCS system must have reaction wheels because maybe it doesn't. Maybe there are other methods out there of achieving the pointing we need. So, so we want to express the, the requirement, the need, not the solution. Make sure that they're necessary. We don't, we, you know, we don't want to have requirements in there uh, just for the sake of having requirements. So you have plenty to track already. Uh, don't make your own life more difficult. A little bit more detail on, on the flow down of them. So you know, obviously, we can have various levels of systems, all the way from kind of comp ultra complicated system of systems down to you know, the, the little components and piece parts. And you want these to be, to be traceable to the higher levels. So we're gonna start a course with our mission statement, our mission objectives, our mission success criteria. And then from there, we're gonna build requirements to meet those things, uh, right? So, so we want our high level requirements to meet. If, if we achieve our high level requirements, we will, have, we will then achieve the mission success. It's possible to sideload requirements in at lower levels, but there should be very good reason for it. And it should, it should be traceable back to a document or some other justification. Otherwise, you know, your requirements should have good flow down from your higher level requirements and, and objectives and criteria. You know, like I said, in UNP, we, we expect you to get down to about the subsystem level. Certainly larger missions, you know, the big flagship NASA missions and stuff, they will go all the way down to piece parts, material, you know, details, things like that, that we find that's not, not typically necessary and, and will definitely slow you down and all the tracing you'll have to do. So uh, UNP tries to get you guys down to the subsystem level. Some different ways we can think about requirements. So, uh, you know, the, the, the one we're primarily going to work with are, are some sort of uh, functional or operational type requirements. Uh, or performance, uh, especially if we're looking on the right on, on functional operational versus physical. You know, the, the ones on the left, all those different flavors, we're, we're going to see stuff like that in, in a lot of our, our CubeSat stuff. And those are all good things to think about. If we, if we look at the right physical versus the functional operational, the, the physical is, is also where we're going to land. The, the functional operational is, is also where we're going to land. The, the physical decomposition, you know, I'm going to try to make a, a plane that looks like a bird generally is, is not the right approach for uh, our CubeSat things. So, so I encourage you to, to look more on the, the functional operational pieces. Some other considerations, there are of course many, many considerations on writing requirements. Requirements are, this is not something that's easy to do. This is something that takes practice and even very experienced people, you can spend plenty of time going back and forth on the specific language of requirement. So certainly, you know, Make, make your first drafts, have them critiqued by people, go back, critique them yourselves. This is something that takes a lot of practice.
some some other things to be aware of gold plated requirements so I'll, I'll talk about this example here where you know maybe the stakeholder wants this very accurate telemetry and and you know many stakeholders may not be as uh, technically adept in the details of your mission so so what they mean by very accurate might might be difficult to understand to begin with but that's something you should certainly understand and, and maybe even push back on if if it's unreasonable maybe that that turns into a requirement that you have to measure telemetry the battery telemetry to within 20 significant digits well that's an awful lot of significant digits and is it really meaningful is that really helpful to go to 20 significant digits uh, from an engineering perspective probably not maybe from the science perspective whatever they're trying to do it's it's necessary but uh, that's something that should be understood because obviously measuring something accurately to within 20 significant digits uh, is is not that easy to do right that will that will increase your technical effort costs all sorts of other things it's gonna gonna make your life rough understanding what is actually necessary and pushing back on things that are not necessary uh, is is very important and so that's that's referred to generally as gold plating a requirement where we just say you know oh this is this sounds really good we'll, we'll do this good thing uh, that was asked of us and we'll go above and beyond um, and frequently going too far above and beyond can 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 make your life more difficult than necessary the good idea fairy uh, this this one is has to do with you know ideas or desirements versus requirements everything you add is is going to uh, you know, add cost, schedule, technical, going to have those impacts. So uh, definitely something to be avoided. Uh, obviously, conflicting requirements, make sure that, that there aren't separate requirements that when taken together uh, result in a, a unrealistic system. And then compounded. Uh, this is one that's actually really easy to do accidentally. And, and so you should look really closely at your requirements and, and try to avoid it because we don't want a requirement to have multiple requirements within it. Every requirement should be independently verifiable. And so we don't want, want a requirement that says, you know, this thing must do this and this. Just break it out into two separate requirements. That, that's a pretty easy one to do, especially when you're first learning to write requirements. And then another piece of that is, is requirement and rationale. The rationale should, should exist probably in a document supporting this. It, it does not uh, it should not exist in the requirement itself. Another way, once we've actually written the requirements, maybe one one exercise we can do to go through and try to see if they're good. This is this is one method. There are many methods out there, um, and of course, I've already talked through many of these similar things. Uh, this is just put into a, a mnemonic. You know, making sure that they're they're valid in this case, meaning verifiable, achievable, logical, uh, and then integral and definitive little bit different words than than we use in the past to describe them but but very similar to what we were saying before on on making sure that you have good requirements this isn't something that i need to belabor too much but uh there there have been numerous studies done by by some of these systems engineering organizations such as incosi compared you know cost to upfront systems engineering effort and and you find that when good requirements were made early on and, and the upfront systems engineering was done well, it, it, it generally pretty much always results in a mission with significant improvements in cost, risk, schedule, all those, all those good things. So how do we track all these? The normal way is the requirements verification matrix. This is the way that you, know, that you and people require of you. Usually it'll be some sort of big Excel table, maybe, maybe something like on the right, uh, how exactly it is up to you, but you wanna make sure that you're tracking all the important pieces so that you, you have a unique identifiers, you know, what documents is verifying it, the language of the requirement, of course, where it flows down to and, and up to, especially what, what it flowed from. Uh, sometimes it can be beneficial to have what it flows to as well. And so, so you know, the exact columns you choose to have is is sort of up to you, but but you'll see some examples and other other pieces that should go into this uh, over the next um, the rest of the presentation. Another note on the RVM, uh, you know, UNP requires this as a deliverable, but the pro the customer of this document should not be us. This is for heavy heavy internal use. This is how you keep everyone on the same page. This is how you know what system you're building uh, and how you're building it. So 
this uh, yes, we require it as a deliverable to to you know get you to do it and be able to provide feedback. But uh, this is not not something that should be regarded as just a deliverable to UNP. In fact, really none of the documents should be. UNP has has intentionally cut out everything ex, you know, extraneous that we can think of to, to make sure that what the documentation you're producing uh, is, is useful to, to you, not, not just to us. Here, here's one example, probably a bit simplified on how this may look in an RVM. So you know, this would be requirement ADCS3. Uh, this would probably be somewhere around the subsystem level for the ADCS. Source in this case is COM2. Well, probably the, you know, there's probably some, some communication constraint that we need to be able to point at our ground station as we fly over. So that, that could be why. And, and of course, you know, associated with that, the antenna has some level of some beam width. And so that's probably why an, an ADCS requirement could flow down from a COM requirement. Now, of course, if your experiment had uh, more stringent requirements than this one degree per axis, then uh, this would probably flow down from the payload as well, and you, you would just keep the requirement that was more stringent, uh, not, not have the one for COM as well. There's many you know, different ways you can verify these. Uh, in this case, you'd, you'd probably do some analysis because ADCS uh, can be very, very difficult to verify the test on the ground. Uh, you're going to want some sort of status of it, and then, and then some level of you know, tie to a document that tracks how you're going to verify it, what you've done to ensure it's verified and the current status and all those things. Every, you know, like, like we were just talking about, every requirement, of course, must be verified to prove that you built the system right. So we certainly need the, the, to have the verification method, status, and, and document. You can also add additional things. Uh, so what does that method look like? Well, there's, there's three common methods. This, this certainly is not you know, the only three methods, but uh, these are probably the most common and, and will cover most of your requirements between the three of them. Um, obviously, test, right? It's most of these, if we can test them, uh, we will want to test them because that tends to be one of the, the best ways to verify something like collecting telemetry uh, at, at some rate, right? Pretty easy to test once your, your system is integrated and functioning. Ones that you can't test, maybe like ADCS on the ground. Uh, that's where analysis might come in, uh, some sort of modeling or simulation environment. And then inspection. Well, there's certain things like, you know, you must use copper wiring. You don't need to like go to a materials lab and stick your copper in, in the machine and make sure that it's, that it's copper. If you buy the right stuff, uh, you can just inspect that you bought the right stuff uh, and it's, it's what the manufacturer you know, said it was going to be. And then you can verify things that way too. A means to track its status. So, you know, the the actual status types you come up with are up to you. The ones on the right here are just not necessarily even suggestions, just some some options you could look into using. If you you know, you don't necessarily have to break it out between engineering and flight, but you could. But the goal is to make it make it apparent and um, and consistent, uh, and obviously reasonably simple, so that so it's not difficult for people to understand what's going on in the RBM. And then the document, like I mentioned, you, you need to uh, have that traceability and the documentation of how you verified it, when it was verified, all, all those things. So when someone in the future comes in and looks at this, well, maybe the system changed a bit and now you need to re-verify it and they need to be able to know, you know did, did my verification from a year and a half ago, does that still stand? Uh, I need to understand what was done and, and if there are any shortcomings there or changes or other things. This is, this is a very critical piece of it as well. How do we actually do this requirements definition, right? We're, we're in these, these red boxes still, and we got to take our stakeholder expectations, the, the experiment plan, con ops, criteria, and objectives. And we have to create high-level requirements. We have to, to do some decomposition down into lower-level things. So this can be kind of an intimidating process at, the, at first. So let's start by, uh, you know, an, a very simplified example, of an already pretty simple mission, uh, right? Sputnik, the first ever artificial satellite. If we were, you know, trying to, to develop Sputnik, we could maybe assume some of these, uh, some of these missions. It was a very simple mission. It was kind of just beeping up there, but obviously it needs to orbit the Earth, right? 
uh, at, at this time, people were able to put stuff suborbital, but but nobody had had really gone orbitally yet. Sputnik shall communicate with the ground, of course. We want to make sure that it's obvious it's up there and we can talk to it. Imaged by the ground, we want to make sure that people can see it and see that, that we've done this. And then, of course, it needs to be the first thing up there. That's That, in this case, was a very important objective. We'll start with these four. And when we start looking into these, these four objectives, we end up with a few things we need to get there. But at the most simple level on this breakdown, we, we're going to need a launch vehicle, obviously. We're going to need uh, a satellite, and we're going to need ground station. So this is kind of the, the very basic level of the float we can do, right? To orbit the Earth, we need the launch vehicle and satellite. To image to be imaged by the Earth, we need a satellite and a ground station. To communicate, we need a satellite and a ground station. And to do it first, we need all three. So we're breaking these down into the specific things beneath them that, that are needed. Now, if we look at, you know, now, now we'll continue to float on even further. So if we take, if we just pull the satellite out of there, now we can go down into, into some, the next level down in a requirement. So a system level requirement, it's a requirement that applies to the entire satellite. Uh, and so that's, that's the next step we're gonna go to. So maybe, maybe this is something we'd come up with. You know, it, it, Sputnik is going to space, obviously it needs to both pride a rocket to get there and it needs to survive in space. When we, uh, we, we could come up with a requirement, something like this one out of the user guide, which is the small set shall be designed to withstand the launch and orbit environments of the launch vehicle without failure, leaking fluids, or releasing anything. And so this is this is a system level requirement that comes again comes straight out of UND, and obviously that applies to the entire vehicle. Uh, it, it's not just going under any one subsystem. So then you know the the next level, of course, below that is our subsystem level requirements, which again should flow down from the mission and the system level. This is this again, they should all they shall tie back up the correct ones. So what does this look like next? Well, obviously the satellite needs to survive launch, so it needs a structure. Uh, so that's certainly something we could pull out of it. it. Needs to communicate with the ground, right? So so we need a comm system on it. It will, you know, that, that comm system will then imply that we need an EPS, we may need some thermal regulation. Uh, so all, all these things are getting flowed down to lower and lower level. Uh, requirements that that all tie back to the the need that came before them. One of the other things that we need to be careful of when we're writing requirements is to not just add things because we're used to having them, right? Just because most satellites have an ADCS and a CDH does not mean every satellite must have an ADCS and a CDH. Those those are things we should only add if we actually need them, and in this case, we didn't need them. Right, that comm system, it was it was just kind of beeping. We can we can probably just within the comm system itself just toggle it on and off. We don't need a, a complicated CDH to tell it to do that. And it was just tumbling. We don't need an actual ADCS to do that either. You know, in this in this very simple example, uh, we only really got to that initial kind of concept creation, right? We're still a long, long ways from the final version of this. That's you know, something obviously we'll need to spiral on. Um, and so, you know, as we look towards SRR, this is something that we'll expect you guys to have done at least a couple of spirals on to get to uh, an RVM that, you know, has all this good flow down that, that makes sense that has requirements that are written well, and, and that tie back to the higher level goals. We'll, we'll go into another example here to kind of show stringing all of this together from the, the high level again back down into the, the lower levels. We'll, uh, we'll talk about this theoretical mission called R3, Rapid Reconnaissance and Response Mission. And the, the original mission statement that we're given by the PI or, or whoever maybe will we'll say, we will characterize the radiation environment in low Earth orbit and evaluate radiation effects, radiation effects on an uncooled microbolometer thermal imager. And the onboard thermal image processing will be used to geolocate thermal features of interest. So we're going to fly, you know, what is this, uh, this thermal imaging thing, we're going to do a couple different cool things with it, characterize it, radiation effects, uh, geolocate stuff on the ground. Well, we can probably break that out into some, some objectives, right? The source of these are, are coming from the mission statement, and we have a couple high-level objectives, right? We, we just pulled out radiation, characterization, and that uh, onboard image processing and uh, and geolocating thermal features. 
So great, we got our three objectives now. Well, maybe not so fast. So if we start to look at these, we can kind of break them into the two separate areas. One of them, the, the first two have to do with the kind of what, how does this microbolometer do in space, right? There's a couple different things around that, but it, but it has to do with trying out this microbolometer in space. And the second one has to do with some algorithm that our PI may care about, uh, you know, finding these, these thermal features on the ground. Again, like I said, this, this first one, you know, they're, they're cool. We want to try it. We want to know how it'll work in space. Uh, and the second one, we have a, this algorithm our PI cares about, so we're also going to do that. Let's go back and, and look at how these tie into our original mission statement. Well, one of the things that, that we find is what is characterizing the radiation environment in low Earth orbit? Do we really need to do that? Is that actually something we care about? Probably not, right? In this case, what we really cared about was these algorithms and seeing how the microbolometer does. Maybe evaluating the radiation effects on the microbolometer is still meaningful, but understanding the rest of the radiation environment in LEO, probably not one of our, our things we actually care about. So let's get rid of that in the mission statement because it's not actually doing us any good. Looking back at what we actually care about, which were these kind of two lighter blue boxes, we can rewrite our mission statement to say, well, we're going to demonstrate the use of an uncooled microbolometer in space and characterize its behavior in the space environment. And then that onboard thermal image processing will be used to geolocate thermal features and interest. Cool. So our mission statement's a little better now. It's a little closer to what we actually care about. Got rid of some of the stuff we didn't. So now let's uh, let's start looking into some of these details about you know what what are the action verbs here that we actually care about. So uh, you know demonstrate, characterized, use it to to do various things, and we can rewrite our mission objectives to the following: demonstrate the use of an uncooled microbolometer, characterize a microbolometer, and utilize onboard image processing to geolocate thermal features of interest. Great, we're, we're starting to get somewhere. Well, again, not so fast. Let's, uh, let's look at a few different pieces of this. What do we have to do to meet these mission objectives, right? So we're gonna start flowing these down uh, and, and we'll see if we break anything along the way. These are all of our mission objectives. We're gonna, we're gonna flow down. Taking infrared pictures, uh, that's obviously something that, that we need to do to demonstrate it. Obviously, we'll also need to do it to characterize it. And of course, we'll need to do it to geolocate stuff. So certainly taking infrared pictures is something we're gonna to need to do. Well, how many pictures, right? That's, that's probably a pretty important piece. Is it one picture? Is it a million pictures? Probably somewhere in between. Well, this is now an opportunity to get into success criteria. You know, maybe there's some, some minimum and full success. Uh, this is usually the way that we'll break it down is we'll say, what is the bare minimum I have to do? And what is kind of the, the higher level? So let's look at minimum success first. Minimum, absolute minimum of what must be done to claim that our mission was successful, that we passed our mission. In this case, it probably is just take one photo. If we take one photo, we have demonstrated the use of the microbolometer. Maybe we wouldn't have met some of the others, but if this could also meet the others, then this would be an adequate minimum mission success criteria. But certainly if we've got this actual, this whole satellite on orbit, we wanna do more than that in an ideal world. Our full success criteria is if we could do everything we wanted it to do. So maybe we're gonna take a photo every day for a year so we can understand some of those environmental effects over time in more detail and, and understand how it works better. So these are kind of the two things we came up with. We're gonna take one image of the earth and we're gonna take at least one thermal image of the earth. Uh, I guess these are both thermal images every day for a year. These are our mission, our first mission success criteria and they tie back to our mission objective. So we'll continue on with this. Obviously we want to take infrared pictures. We also wanted to study the temperature effects. That's going to come down from the characterization. We want to study the radiation effects. Also going to come down from the, the characterization. And then geolocation uh, of, that, of that thermal feature is going to also pull from a few of those, right? The microbometer and the, the other one. So let's, uh, let's start to look at, at these in more detail. We've got our mission success criteria. Are they, are they adequate? Are they good enough? The, at the higher level, at the mission statement level, at the mission objective level, uh, at those levels, we can be a little bit softer in our language, a little bit more qualitative. 
once we get to mission success criteria, things really need to start becoming quantitative. Uh, there, there, there needs to be measurable values of success so we can take our actions with our satellite and point back and say, yes, we did this thing, this well, this many times, et cetera. Before we had these words like, uh, like enough and things like that, but in this case, now we need an actual quantitative data. And so we look at this and we say, well, what is enough? That could mean something different to everyone. So enough is not the right word here. We need to come up with an actual word, an actual amount to put in here. Amount of data, amount of images, uh, maybe what those images should include. Regard, you know, what, whatever it may be, uh, we need to do some analysis probably. We need to determine what the stakeholders really care about. Uh, but this needs to be a quantitative measure uh, in, in here, not just the word enough because this is a mission success criteria now. Characterization, what does characterize mean? How are we doing it, right? Again, at the higher level, yeah, this is probably fine, but uh, now that we're a mission success criteria, we need to understand the details of what does this actually mean because we need to start writing requirements to do this. Uh, and if we don't know what this actually means in detail and can't agree on it, then, then we can't write requirements for it. What are we trying to say in this one? Well, we want to know how radiation affects it. Uh, in order to do that, we want to see if bid flips or dead pixels correlate to the radiation environment. And we want to get radiation readings of the dosimeter and compare that to defects in the infrared images. When you take all this together, we want to take a thermal image and compare defects to the radiation environment. Maybe this is a better option. We're going to take some number of thermal images and compare them to the radiation environment. What that comparison actually looks like, again, may leave a little bit open to interpretation, but, but we're definitely improved over the last one. Well, how many comparisons do we need? In this case, you know, this is, is something that we have to go do some analysis on. We'd have to try to understand uh, what our stakeholders care about, all those good things. Once we get through that, that process, and that, that, that's why we you know, talk about all these cycles we have to do, uh, maybe we come up with this list of mission success criteria. So. We're going to take one thermal image of Earth and one thermal image of Earth every day for a year, right? There's our minimum in full on our first success criteria and, and so on. And so all those minimum must be met in order to, to say that our mission was successful. Uh, and then the full, of course, are the things we're actually designing to. Those are the things we're striving towards, those are the things we're designing to, with the understanding that we'll still be happy if we get our minimums out of it. Throughout all of this, you know, we, we talked about the word characterize there, and, and I was poking at that, but it's certainly not the only word, and, and this list is also certainly not exhaustive. But if you see words like this, they tend to be red flags that they, there needs to be more analysis or more thinking or, or something has to change here. These are all words that, that mean different things to different people, and they need to be uh, quantitative instead of so qualitative. We'll, we'll go back to this just once more. You know, the, this mission will demonstrate the use of the uncooled microbolometer in space, characterize the behavior. You know, this is a fine mission statement. It can use those softer words at this level. We're going to break that down into mission objectives. We're going to break that down into, uh, you know, mission success criteria. Break that down now into system and subsystem level requirements. Well, in this case, you know, the, we have this controlled slew rate requirement that came up. That probably comes from, from the camera needing to be pointed at an object as we fly over it, right? So, so that's kind of where this one would, would flow in underneath the higher level requirements. Another example, the U, this one comes out of UNP, the 60, 60 dB margin in the, the communications link. So this one, this is a little bit forced in that you are expected to just kind of copy the UNP one straight into uh, your RVM, how exactly you track them is up to you, but, but they need to, to be copied over. So this one's a bit forced in that it's, it's repeated, not quite verbatim here. Com could imply we need some sort of pointing requirements. And, and so that could also create a control requirement. And then now the controlling requirement may create a knowledge requirement because a lot of times you need better knowledge than, than you're able to control to. Uh, so now maybe that flows down again into, uh, you know, we need this attitude determination of some level, maybe one degree per axis, and then the, the control can then be the 10 degree per axis we need to hit our link margin. So throughout all of these, right, we need to, to make sure that 
they they tie to the higher levels correctly. And then of course we have to make sure that they're necessary and that they're what we need, not not gold plated or or something that just sounds good. A few other things that we would have to think about in this case, right? Will our our control and determination requirements conflict with the slew rate requirements? We indicated this need from the data budget for an S-band radio, which is what drove us to the ADCS requirements. Uh, but maybe that creates some other other uh, issues with costs or other you know, frequency licensing, other things. Uh, EPS obviously has to be able to power everything. And then again, looking at all this taken as a whole, when we flow it back up, does it actually meet what our system has to do? Right? Does the ConOps and experiment plan do those all? Those all uh, do what they're supposed to do. So these are all trades that you need to uh, take into consideration as you're as you're going through this. We filled out the RVM now. We've gone through this process. Uh, so what now? We're we're done with it, right? We turned it into UMP. No, this is is always a living document. This is not something that that should just be used once and ignored. This is your way of of passing down to to everyone throughout the lifetime of the mission, what you're doing, why you're doing it, how well you're doing it. And things in this likely will change. You know, As the CONOPS gets more developed, it'll likely change uh, some of the things that you have to do. And it could provide pushback all the way to the RBM. And so it, it is possible to change this after the fact uh, with the proper, proper procedures and cognizance of, of where the requirements came from in the first place, which is another reason for good documentation. So that's what I have for you today. Obviously, you know, there's there's a lot more information out there than can be provided in just a single slide, uh, hour long slide deck. So this will all, of course, be available on BDL, the slides and the presentation. But yeah, there's there's more detail in the user guide. Of course, more AATs will talk about some of these things. Uh, with that, does anybody have any questions? Hey Jesse, I have a quick question. Can yeah, you go ahead. Yep. Okay. Cool. So, when you're with these requirements, should we be considering verification alongside of them, or completely independent? Yeah. So when you when you create a requirement, you should definitely keep verification in mind. Obviously, you're not going to be verifying them yet, but you don't want to create a requirement that you can't verify. They they definitely need to be verifiable, and and so you should always keep in mind the you know what does this look like to people down the road? What will they have to do? to verify well, it. In your example, you had the dimensions of your CubeSat will meet a specific deployer's uh, dimensions. Um, yep. And I was just kind of curious uh, with that verification. And I mean, obviously that's your requirement, your verification. I mean, you're just gonna inspect it. Would you just state something like that? Or would you say something to the degree of like consistently make sure that all of my future designs will fit into the dimensions required by the uh, deployer's specifications? Yeah, I would I would say the the verification process for something like that would be most of those CubeSat deployers when you actually go to deliver to the launch vehicle, they will have like a check sheet that you have to go in and actually measure pieces of your CubeSat or it's okay. The the UNP requirement is a bit odd in that it it's not not quite as specific, right? All it's doing is it's, it's saying you will follow someone else's document once you choose one of them. So admittedly, some of the UNP requirements are a bit, maybe even you could even say not good requirements because they're more broad to 18 different missions, not a single mission. And so the, the verification process for that would likely look like you've chosen your specific, your specific deployer, and then you would maybe put a requirement in that flows from the UNP one, that is, we will meet the requirements of the you know, Cal Poly, CubeSat standard, revision, whatever. Uh, and then when you would, to verify that, it would be whatever process they require, which is usually some sort of like checklist where you are just measuring dimensions and, and things like that. The, the key though is to make sure that everyone understands what that verification looks like and kind of how you did it, why you did it, because uh, as well as why you created requirements. Because I, I constantly see in UNP, you know, these, these students three, four years down the line come back and look at a requirement and go, why do we have this requirement? What is it here for? Why, you know, what, what, where did this specific number come from? Uh, and so documenting all those pieces uh, is, is important. Okay, so it's okay to be specific with your verification uh, just because you are specific with your requirements. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very, uh, it's completely fine to be very specific with the, the verification. It's, I'd say it's actually encouraged to have the documentations that, that says, you know, this is how we will verify it. 
them. And that way, when someone else comes back to it and goes, oh, that requirement's verified, you know, two years later, they can go look up, well, what did they do to verify it? And maybe something has changed where that verification process is no longer valid. And so the, ver the status of being verified is also no longer valid. Yeah, documenting these things is, is going to pay off in the long run, especially for UNP teams that have such high turnover. And, and the new students coming in may not understand, you know, the decisions made by those before them. Okay, thank you very much.